Now, like many sensory neurons, cells in V1 have receptive fields. So to illustrate that, here is a monkey looking at a screen and not to scale, here's a neuron where the experimenter is recording the activity of that neuron. And on this screen, we've marked the receptive field of this neuron and it will only respond to visual stimuli within this receptive field. So if you present visual stimuli elsewhere on the screen, the neuron won't respond, won't respond here. But if you present inside the receptive field, then you get a really strong response from the neuron. So it's responding just to one particular region of the visual field. Here's a diagram showing receptive field centres uh, for retinal ganglion cells. So the idea is you've got an on centre, off surround, and here in the on centre, uh, the ganglion cell in question is receiving input from a whole bunch of receptors um, and it's the position of these receptors on the retina that defines the receptive field centre and it's pooling effectively all these together to give its, get its own receptive field. And here we have a, an adjacent ganglion cell that's receiving input from some different photoreceptors but there's some overlap so again the receptive field centres have a certain overlap in space. And it's exactly the same in V1, except we've now been through a few more synapses to get to V1 neurons. Now V1 receptive fields, if you ask how big they are, the answer depends on where the receptive field is in the retina. Cells that have receptive fields very close to the fovea, so just a few degrees from the centre of your vision, tend to be very small. Um, one degree or less. So a degree of visual angle is roughly your thumbnail held at arm's length. So if you do that, that's roughly what one degree of visual angle looks like. But as you go out to the visual periphery, the receptive fields get bigger and bigger. And of course that matches the fact that whereas we can resolve very fine details in the centre of our vision, in our visual periphery we see less and less detail. And actually jumping ahead a little bit, uh, this is a property that you see again in other retinotopic visual areas that we're going to get on to. So there are visual areas called V2 and V4, and their receptive fields tend to be much bigger than in V1, but you still see this same pattern, that even within V2 they are much smaller for neurons whose receptive fields are close to the fovea than for neurons that are looking at the visual periphery. So we've got this picture then, hopefully, that if V1 neurons are wired up to photoreceptors in a particular region of the retina, and that's the receptive field. Furthermore, nearby photoreceptors are connected to nearby neurons, and that's called retinotopic organisation, or a retinotopic map. So the idea here is, if I've got four V1 neurons, and I've colour-coded them red, green, blue, and orange, and they're next to each other in cortex, okay, so as I move across the cortex, I go from one V1 neuron to another, then chances are that their receptive fields on the retina are also going to be adjacent to one another and as I move from one neuron to another the receptive fields of each neuron move smoothly across the retina. Now you remember that we went through the chiasm to show that the uh, right half of the visual field maps onto the left visual cortex and you can see that here. So for example these areas 3, 7 and 11 in the upper right visual field and map on to the left half of the brain um, on the bottom half of the calcarine sulcus whereas 4, 8 and 12 map on to the upper bank here but again in the left half of the brain and similarly over here for the left half of the visual field mapping on to the right hemisphere visual cortex. I've talked briefly, I've alluded to the presence of other visual areas and that's what this diagram is showing here. So we've seen the optic nerve from the eyes going to the LGN and the optic radiation uh, going first of all to primary visual cortex V1. But in this diagram you can see that there are many other brain areas marked on, so V2, V3, V3A and so on. There are lots and lots of visual areas in the brain. Retinotopy has actually been a really important way in helping us study these brain areas. 
um, it can be used in fMRI to help localize V1 and these other visual areas. So we know roughly where V1, V2 and so on are in different people's brains, but in each individual they're at slightly different locations. Everyone's brain is a little bit different. So how can we know where V1 or V2 is in your particular brain? Well, you've probably heard about fMRI, uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging, sometimes just called brain imaging or brain scanning. And it uses the fact that oxygenated and deoxygenated blood resonate differently in a magnetic field. And so what that means is you're actually able to monitor tiny changes in blood flow within the human brain. And from that, you can get an estimate of brain activity. Now, it's not telling you directly about the activity of neurons in your brain. You're having to infer that from the changes in blood flow. But roughly speaking, the more active neurons are, the more energy they're using up, the more oxygen they demand. And so you should see a change in the blood oxygenation level, uh, which you can use to infer the existence of that increase in brain activity. Now, you can have people lie in a scanner and look at patterns like this. So a high contrast, flickering checkerboard image like this. Here at a particular eccentricity, and you can see the eccentricity is changing um, as we go through this pattern. And again, here you've got the top uh, left part of the visual field, the bottom left, the bottom right, the top right, and so on. So you've got this chunk of activity going around the visual field. And that will be activating different parts of the brain. Obviously here, you're going to be activating brain regions which respond to the top left of the visual field. Here, you'll be activating brain regions that respond to this particular range of eccentricities. So by correlating the brain activity with when you display these particular images, you can work out which regions of the visual field are given point in the brain, a given voxel as it's described, is actually responding to. And that's what's been plotted here. So this is plotting the, um, if you like, the angle. Uh, so it's, it's ignoring eccentricity, but it's saying um, what o'clock uh, does a particular region of brain respond to. So things that are in the upper visual field here, you can see those are different shades of red. And then you've marked on the brain um, that th this point in the brain would be uh, where neurons are responding to things close to the upper part of the visual field, so near 12 o'clock. Um, and then similarly down here, we have some other brain regions that also respond to those regions of the visual field. And then the green is more for things that are out to the side and the blue for things that are down the bottom of the visual field. And this is just one half of the brain, the right half of the brain, so it's the left part of the visual field only. Now, what's is particularly useful um, is that the retinotopic mapping reverses at various points within the brain and it reverses as we change between um, different brain areas. So in V1, we know V1 is likely to be around the calcarine sulcus, which you can see marked here. And then you can see the smoothly uh, varying uh, preferred location of the receptor fields as we go across V1. And then we get to a certain point down here where we've got to the top of the receptor field and now it reverses. Now it changes over so it's going down to like 10 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 7 o'clock, you know, and then you get down to sort of 6 o'clock. And that tells us that we have now changed from V1 to V2. And then it reverses again and we get into V3 and so on. This is the V ventral means this is the, vent uh, the ventral part of V2. Ventral meaning um, the bottom half of the brain. And over here, we've got the other half of V2, V2 dorsal. So it's wrapping around. So we have a dorsal part of V2 and a ventral part of V2. But you can use this retinotopy, this retinotopic mapping, to deduce where the different brain regions are in a living human being, which is, as you can imagine, very useful and actually is a really incredible achievement, I think.